In the immortal words of Monty Python, now for something completely different. Hello, my name is Robert Webb. I am the face behind Brainstorm Lore, and for once, I'm going to talk about a backstory of my own creation, instead of someone else's. I'm currently writing a sci-fi adventure comic called Babylon Rocker, and I've managed to find a decent artist for it. There's a link to his work in the description. So, for the next few weeks, I'm going to be talking about my own work as a way to advertise it, by talking about the backstory of the universe and the characters. Who knows, maybe I'll even start a Kickstarter. We'll see. If I sound really awkward on unnatural, well, now you know why I prefer to hide behind a cartoon avatar. But now that that's out of the way, let's start at the beginning. It began with the end of the Age of Democracy, what the neo-feudalists like to call the dreaming. Because the way that they put it, the post-enlightenment ideas of personal freedom, equality before the law, holding the powerful to account, they weren't evil ideas, but they were misguided ones. The people that had lived during the dreaming, as they put it, were naive and overly idealistic. They wanted to believe in the better nature of humanity so much that they completely ignored the darker side, the grimmer side, the unpleasant side. The simple fact is that the masses, the demos, the people, whichever you like to call it, are no more virtuous or suited to rule than single rulers, whether they be monarchs or dictators. Inevitably, this ultimately means that it was destined to fail, because social entropy is a constant, that the people were ultimately going to cede away, to give up the freedoms and equalities that they had fought for in the past. And if it was inevitable that it was going to fail, then surely authoritarian leadership, top-down leadership, must be the natural state of man. And that's sort of how they sold it when they took power in the year 0 PA. That is, zero post-awakening. That said, neo-feudalism didn't begin with the death of democracy. No, first there was a transition period. A very painful transition period. First, there was the formation of the superstates, With concepts like freedom and equality and sovereignty out the window, the ideas of respecting the rights of peoples didn't matter anymore, and so the most powerful countries began swallowing up territory. And so you had this situation here. In red, you have the Democratic Republic of America and its allies, in green, you have the People's Republic of Latin America. In purple, you have the South Atlantic Commonwealth. In pink, you have the Oceanic Commonwealth. In orange, the Democratic Republic of South Asia. In teal, the Second Russian Federation. In yellow, the Second Rashidun Caliphate. And in blue, the European People's Empire. The gray represents disputed territory. Naturally, all of the dictators and or ruling parties that ran these authoritarian superstates wanted to rule the world, but now all their rivals were simply too strong, and so the superstates settled into an uneasy period known as the Second Cold War. The Second Cold War is divided into roughly three phases, the Active Phase, the Passive Phase, and the Great Flower Wars. The Active Phase of the Second Cold War mostly referred to the part where there was actual fighting. Of course, there was military conflict in the unclaimed zones, but there was also biological warfare. Each of the superstates by this point had developed bioweapons, viruses that they could use to try and cripple one another's populations and thus make them easier to take over. Unfortunately, this didn't really work, as the superstates had by this point all mastered cloning technology and could simply decant a couple hundred thousand new citizens every time some of them dropped dead. Eventually, everybody realized just how pointless this all was and reluctantly agreed to peace, thus beginning the so-called passive phase. Naturally, they were all untrustworthy and still looking for a chance to take over the world, but for the time being, there was at least no active conflict. Plenty of espionage, though. Time passed and the dictators spent much of their time oppressing their own people instead of trying to mess with each other until they discovered a few decades later that they had a completely different problem than losing half their population to disease during the active phase of the Cold War. 
Now, the populations were growing and there were simply too many people in the world. The problem was that while all the superstates realized that their populations were swiftly becoming unsustainable, none was willing to risk using domestic policy to reduce their population growth. After all, China had done something similar and that is what had led to it imploding and therefore being dismembered between Russia, South Asia, and America. In the end, the dictators all agreed to engage in what was called the Great Flower Wars, a particularly nasty and inhumane solution for a big problem. Now, the name Flower Wars came from something that the ancient Aztecs used to do. They would essentially declare war on neighboring tribes, not to gain territory, but for the purpose of taking captives to sacrifice in their rituals. That really is what made the name Flower Wars applicable, because these people were literally being sent off by their governments to get killed, and for no other reason. Bit of a fun fact here. When I first came up with the idea for the Great Flower Wars, the first thing that actually passed through my head was like a kind of prequel TV series about the Flower Wars where the intro would be sacrificed by Motorhead. But even this was not enough to save the super states from dissolution. It was just one more indignity heaped upon their groaning populace. And as the people became increasingly discontent, the leaders became increasingly riven by factionalism, as different political units began to turn on one another. All that was needed was a spark, and that spark finally arose in the Second Rashidun Caliphate in what is now Syria in the year 75 BA. It's unknown exactly how it began. Some say that it was spontaneous riots. Others say that it was instigated, either by local preachers or perhaps, according to some, members of the inner elite who were hoping to use the mob to seize power for themselves. We'll never know because the evidence has been lost to history. The Caliphate might have survived if its leadership had remained unified, but by this point the factionalism had run too deep. Instead, the different factions within the government tried to use the riots to oust their rivals from power, only to discover that once released from the bottle, there was simply no putting the genie back, and soon enough, the government was overthrown. In an effort to bolster their own flagging governments, the neighboring superstates of Russia, Europe, the South Atlantic Commonwealth, and South Asia broadcast the news of the Caliphate's fall hoping that the fall of a rival state might distract the populace from their own problems. Instead, the citizenry saw the fall of the caliphate and took it as a sign that they too could successfully overthrow their tyrannical masters. And from there, it spread to all of the super states throughout the globe. By this point, even the military wouldn't support their own governments. And as any dictator will tell you, once you've lost the army, it's pretty much over. Seeing the writing on the wall, the former ruling elites attempted to flee into space. Although humanity had not yet begun colonizing other planets, they had created multiple space stations where human life could survive. Unfortunately, the garrisons aboard those space stations captured the fleeing rulers and executed them to a man. And so, just like that, the great superstates fell apart in what became known as the Dissolution, or the Great Anarchy. Chaos reigned as small, local strongmen and petty tyrants set up miniature states of their own amidst the ruins of what had once been. And it was here, amid the wreckage, that neo-feudalism truly began. Ever since the Enlightenment, there had always been certain philosophers and intellectuals who had thought that they should be the ones to decide the destiny of civilization, rather than kings or elected politicians. These intellectuals, primarily based out of what had once been the European Empire, saw in the Great Anarchy the chance to finally create that utopian society they had dreamed of for centuries, a newocracy, a rule by the wise, where they would lead as Plato's philosopher kings. The intellectuals managed to successfully persuade a few idealistic warlords in the border regions between what had once been France and Germany, and decided to use this as the nucleus of what would hopefully be their utopia. Unfortunately, like most intellectuals, these were men and women who believed that reality ought to conform to match their ideological axioms, not the other way around. 
Such people unsurprisingly make for bad leaders, and at last the warlords that they had allied themselves with grew sick of their poor leadership and overthrew the philosopher kings. For these warlords had learned much from the intellectuals, and so, in an attempt to justify their rule, they decided to adopt a modified version of the intellectual's ideology as their own, and thus was born neo-feudalism. Where the ideology of the intellectuals had been most inspired by Plato, the ideology of the neo-feudalists, although none of them knew it at the time, was most in common with the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. Rather than intelligence or wisdom, the neo-feudalists, like Nietzsche, argued that authority was derived from strength, the strength to impose one's own morals and one's own authority on others. Most of the neo-feudalists had been men of humble origin, many of them had been uneducated, and yet they had risen to dominance on the basis of their own abilities to crush the opposition. Neo-feudalism justifies itself on the premise that principles like freedom and equality are not, in fact, what people really want, even though they might claim otherwise. If the people really had wanted such things, and if they'd wanted to keep them, why had they grown complacent and willingly ceded their rights to authoritarians like the dictators of the superstates? Ultimately, according to the neo-feudalists, despite their claims to the contrary, the people don't really want freedom, they want benevolent dictatorship. That said, the intellectuals had been right about one thing. The age of democracy, what the neo-feudalists rebranded as the dreaming, had come about for a reason. There had to have been a reason why the old monarchies and aristocracies, which they then rebranded as paleo-feudalism, had failed. According to the neo-feudalists, paleo-feudalism had failed by placing far too much emphasis on inheritance, the idea that one's worth was determined entirely by blood relation to a single family line. Such beliefs had rendered paleo-feudalistic systems inflexible, unable to adapt or improve. As such, while the neo-feudalists ultimately adopted a class system which they had taken from the intellectuals they had overthrown, it would include, unlike paleo-feudalism, a greater degree of social mobility. Your average neo-feudalist society is comprised of five classes. Some planetary cultures have more classes, some have less, but five is the general rule of thumb. Starting from the bottom, you have the mob, the common people, then the moneyed class, those who have obtained wealth through either business or mercantile endeavors, then the learned class, those who have attained careers in the professions, like lawyers, doctors, scientists, etc. Above them is the military class, and above them in turn is the ruling elite. The general idea is that someone from the mob can join the moneyed class by obtaining enough personal wealth. He can then send his children to be schooled to become one of the learned class. These schools are generally run by the neo-feudalist ruling elite, both to educate the children in their particular professions, but also to indoctrinate them into supporting the status quo. Those of the learned class that are especially successful are permitted to have their children apply for service in the military and thus join the military class. In turn, the children of the military class who have achieved a certain rank are allowed to join the ruling class, either through marriage or adoption. In this way, according to neo-feudalism, the ruling elite are constantly replenished by a constant but controlled influx of the best and brightest from their society. Essentially a fancy socio-political way of saying the cream rises to the top. Even so, neo-feudalism would not have been as successful as it was if the people of Earth weren't so tired of decades of chaos and anarchy. And so, neo-feudalism spread and became the dominant political ideology across the planet, and even across the stars, as humanity finally gained enough stability and prosperity to begin colonizing other worlds. And so, 252 years after the Awakening, there arose on Luna a man named Rufus Niccolo Blackstone, the future founder of the Saul Hegemon. Born into the ruling class of one of the neo-feudalist kingdoms of Luna, Rufus Blackstone was a man of great ambition. Not content to rule a single kingdom, he wished to one day unify all of humanity under his dynasty. 
As soon as he inherited the throne of Mare Tranquillitas, Rufus began to set his plans into motion. He formed a grand alliance with three other prominent lunar kingdoms, and through them subjugated the rest of Luna. He then proceeded to assassinate his fellow co-rulers, making himself sole undisputed master of Luna. Then, after ten years of patient military buildup, Rufus launched a sudden attack on Earth, capturing all of its orbital space stations and giving his forces total supremacy over the space surrounding the home world of humanity, forcing its population to submit to his rule. From there, he proceeded to conquer the rest of the Sol system and add its colonies to his domain. Mars and the moons of Jupiter were conquered by force, while the moons of Saturn, dominated by Titan, were brought into the Sol hegemon through diplomacy and a marriage alliance between one of Rufus's daughters and the son of the Lord of Titan. And so, with the solar system unified under his rule, the new emperor of the Sol hegemon decided to dedicate the remainder of his life to consolidating what he had gained. His intention was that his descendants would use the unified Sol system as a jumping off point, from which they could spread their influence and unify humanity under their rule. But time passed, the emperor grew old, his mind began to decay, and he became increasingly attracted to a religion that viewed Earth as sacred and that humanity was a corrupting stain upon it. It didn't help that the people of Earth were the most rebellious of his new subjects. Finally, in a fit of either insanity or fanaticism, no one is sure which, the Emperor demanded that the people of Earth leave the homeworld. Naturally, they refused, for it was an absurd demand. And then, Emperor Rufus Blackstone put all of the mass murderers of human history to shame. He unleashed bioweapons upon the planetary population, viruses that had been specially tailored to attack, infect, and kill only humans. From a population of billions, the people of Earth was reduced to only a few million within less than a month, and the survivors in desperation fled into space to avoid being infected. All of human space was horrified when it received the news, and the only thing that helped keep the Sol hegemon from falling apart was that the Emperor's son and heir assassinated his father and then publicly executed all those involved in this heinous crime. However, there would be no homecoming for the survivors of Earth, for the new Emperor feared that if allowed to return, they and their resentment could one day become a threat to him and his government, and so he banished them from the Sol system. These remnants of humanity became nomadic migrant fleets known as the Earthers, and trust me when I say that no one in the universe hates the Empire of the Sol Hegemon more than they do. Despite this horrific black stain on its founding, the Sol Hegemon would hold itself together for at least 700 years, and under subsequent emperors and empresses would indeed expand outward, adding worlds and systems to their domain. But all things must come to an end, and at long last, in the reign of the Emperor Cataphras Blackstone, the revolution happened. Neo-feudalism may have claimed ascendancy over the ideas of the old world, but that did not mean that those ideas had died. Two strains of thought, two remnants of the world that had once been, survived the Great Anarchy. Those who adhered to a philosophy of individual rights and liberties called themselves the Lockeans in honor of the philosopher John Locke, whose mantra had been life, liberty, and property. Another strain of thought, those who followed the teachings of Karl Marx and of social equality, called themselves the Equitists. Though these two ideologies had been rivals for centuries, after living under the boot of neo-feudalism and the expansion of the Sol hegemon, the two revolutionary strains of thought agreed to join forces and overthrow the Sol hegemon. Slowly but surely, one by one, revolutionary cells began forming, both on independent worlds and on those in thrall to the Sol hegemon, until finally, at long last, a revolution led by infiltrators from the moons of Jupiter led to the overthrow of the Emperor Cataphras, as well as his assassination and those of most of the royal family. The revolutionaries broadcast their victory throughout Imperial space, 
conquering Mars and simultaneously launching an attack on Titan, hoping to knock out the Imperial fleet. As the news of the Emperor's death spread throughout the Sol Hegemon, worlds began to burn in revolt. Unfortunately, victory brought infighting, as the two different strains of revolutionary thought found themselves at odds with one another. And so they were caught unprepared when a royalist counter-coup managed to displace them and place the Emperor's surviving heir, the foppish and hedonistic Croesus Blackstone, on the Imperial throne. To make matters worse, the revolutionary attempt to take out the Imperial fleet ended in failure, so that while the revolutionaries hold Mars and the Jovian moons, the Sol Hegemon retains control of Luna and Titan. But it was too little too late for the Sol Hegemon. News of the overthrow and, albeit temporary, victory of the revolutionaries has spread throughout human-occupied space. Whole systems have been destabilized and thrown into confusion, and even those worlds independent of imperial rule have not managed to remain immune from the aftershocks of this momentous event. And that is the overarching backstory of Babylon Rocker. I'm sorry for the few technical problems I haven't managed to iron out, and for my incredibly awkward performance. Hopefully I will get better at both in the next two videos. So now that I've talked about the history of this little story of mine, next week I'm going to talk about the setting, as well as my many influences and what inspired me to make it. And the final week, I'll talk about the most important aspect of any story, the characters of Babylon Rocker, and how they're trying to get by in a universe that has essentially gone insane. Until then. <laughs>